Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the first session of uh, what is, I think, a, a world first, actually, a, a symposium on uh, Arab dramaturgies. And uh, my name is Peter Eckersall, and I'm the executive officer of the PhD program in theatre and performance here at the Graduate Centre. And uh, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you for coming along for the panel today, but also to my colleagues who are uh, lined up here from the left, uh, Professor Frank Henschke, who's the executive director of the Anthony Siegel Theatre Centre and the co-organizer of this program. Um, Professor Martin Carlson, my colleague from the uh, PhD program in theatre, uh, who is, as you're probably all very well aware, a distinguished scholar of Arabic theatre, and I think somebody who's very much helped make this happen today. Um, and I also welcome our two colleagues from the American University of uh, Beirut, Sahas Asaf and uh, Professor Robert Myers. So um, very much welcome. And Samar, who's been organizing this and all the work for us, um, really very much. So thank you very much for that as well. Um, and um, just very quickly, this is uh, an initiative of an exchange between uh, the Graduate Center and uh, the American University of Beirut. Um, it was an exchange initiated by our two presidents, President Chase Robinson and President Paolo, um, is it um, Hakuni? Fadlul uh, Puri. Uh, Puri, so I apologize uh, for my Arabic pronunciation. Uh, this is an ongoing exchange uh, of which we are in a sense, the first part of. So it's very bizarre and rare in, in our world of uh, theatre academia that one is asked to begin, initiate uh, an exchange program through the bridge of theatre, but that is in fact what has happened here. So uh, we've been very fortunate to receive support from both universities and we've had a number of uh, 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 initiatives already as a part of this exchange that included a, a prior visit, a play reading, um, um, by um, Saha Asaf and uh, also uh, a number of our faculty and our students, including Ashley Marinaccio, have gone to AUB uh, to present uh, papers at a conference there. Uh, Martin also went to that conference and our colleague Jean Graham Jones. Um, uh, and uh, in a couple of weeks' time, a, a group of faculty from uh, the uh, Graduate Centre are going down to uh, Beirut to uh, do some lectures and to meet colleagues there and talk about uh, the future of the exchange. So um, this is indeed a fortuitous opportunity and a rare opportunity that we receive support from our universities to talk about our current So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation over the next day and a half. So I'll just very quickly pass on to my colleagues to meet. Uh, a quick welcome to the Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, is it on? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter, Salma, Frank, Martin, for uh, putting this together. This It's wonderful to be here at Sahar Asaf. I'm a um, theatre maker based in Beirut, Lebanon, at, at the American University of Beirut, where Robert and I, we co uh, direct the theatre initiative, which is part of this exchange that Peter was telling you about. Our thanks to uh, uh, President uh, Chase Robinson and Professor Joy Connolly and also our Dean uh, Nadia Sheikh, Dean of Arts and Sciences at AUB and President Fadlou Khoury for really pushing forward for this to happen. It's wonderful again to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to participate in this conversation and discover together what it is at Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, and we're going to ask um, Robert to start um, the first uh, presentation. We have a time limit being 12 to 15 minutes, so um, right, I hope we'll be in there. We really will have to perhaps interrupt it. We will have the full, uh, we will have the full uh, contributions online, or we also plan a, a small publication. So I'm Frank Henschke from the Martin Siegel Theater Center. We organized this event. Um, and we uh, put it together with some and also with the American University of Beirut and there's the PhD program in theater. So thank you all. And Robert, uh, here we go. The clock is starting. <laughs> Sorry. 
So, uh, Saha? Yeah. Yeah, I could just help me for a second. Thank you. The slideshow here begins. Slideshow. That's why it's called a slideshow. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. <coughs> and uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to use the mic. It has to be recorded. So. Oh, do I need the mic? Yes. Oh, okay. I need the mic. Um, <laughs> Tell Frank, he's like Senator Grassley, you have like five minutes. That's good. Um, uh, uh, thank you again. I'd like to reiterate uh, my gratitude to uh, Marvin, to uh, Frank, to Peter Eckersall, to Jean Graham Jones, to all of our friends uh, uh, here at CUNY. We look forward to many more collaborations and exchanges. Um, the dramaturgical model that I would like to describe to you today uh, briefly is one that I developed with uh, Sahar Asaf at the American University of Beirut in the last five years. Um, I'm simply showing you some images from uh, these uh, productions. Um, we believe that it is a singular model uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East, Levant. It began in 2013 with our first production of an English language version of Tukus al Ishrat wa Tahawalat, Rituals uh, of Signs and Transformations by the Syrian playwright Sadala Wanus, which was produced by AB, uh, where we both teach and work. Um, we've refined this model um, in more than half a dozen subsequent productions, including Wanus's Ale Tisab, The Rape. Um, a 2015 production, which was also uh, staged in English. Uh, Watch Your Step, I'll show you a bit of film from it uh, later. A site-specific faux architectural tour of Beirut's uh, Handak al Ramik neighborhood, performed in Lebanese colloquial Arabic, which was inspired by the Argentine Griselda Gambaro's uh, uh, play about, what is it for foreigners? Information. Information for foreigners, thank you. Um, and uh, Al Malik Lear, uh, which um, uh, was translated to Lebanese vernacular by Sahar uh, Nadasab and others, and co directed by Rachel Valentine Smith of the Faction uh, Theatre in London. Um, let me show you another image from it with uh, Sahar, who's not only the director who performed the role of uh, Cordelia. And our most recent production, another site-specific Lebanese vernacular version of Garcia Lorca's Blood Wedding, which was staged in the Lebanese uh, village of Hamana, and many of you um, who are here today um, actually came. That was the opening event of uh, an international conference at AEB that was co-sponsored uh, by CUNY on Latin America, Al-Andalus, and the Arab world, which traced cultural, ling linguistic, literary, and theatrical continuities among the three regions. Um, and this is an image from uh, the play. Uh, the dramaturgical model we have developed at AB um, involves using a production course as at once a practicum in which students have a conservatory style experience in which they work side by side with seasoned professionals and a dramaturgical course in which we engage in translation studies and practice, textual analysis, theater and performance history, visual studies, and workshop techniques guided by Sahara Saf, who is the director of the production, and by me. I work as the producer and dramaturg, and we work closely with local professionals, including lighting designers, uh, stage designers, costume designers, composers, etc. My role as producer is to help conceive of projects, to raise money to oversee the budget, and to help promote the play. My role as dramaturg in, in, includes introducing students to a range of topics associated with the play we are staging, acting as a curator for the director uh, and uh, designers, engaging in textual analysis and adapting the text um, that uh, uh, I co-translate with Nanda Saab, assuming it's in English. So we go both ways, from Arabic to English, English to um, uh, Arabic. Um, and that's an integral part of what it is that we do, is we necessarily are working with many uh, languages, which in and of itself is a very sort of, I think, unique experience in, in the creation of uh, dramaturgy. Um, 
I'd like to give a few examples of how this process has functioned in our most recent productions, make a couple of observations about what it might say about contemporary Arab dramaturgy in general. For Rituals and Signs of Transformation, I was the co-translator with Nanda Saad, the text into English, which, as uh, I said, is the second or third language of many of the, uh, those uh, who were working on the play. Nonetheless, since they could understand the Arab original well, which was written in formal Arabic, my explanations of the process of trying to find an analogous rhetorical register in English necessarily um, required uh, or became a form of textual analysis. We also invited a series of scholars to speak on a range of topics that included the concept of public-private space in the 19th century Arab city, stage design and concepts of space uh, such as Bachelard's theories, and um, a Shakespeare scholar who came and talked about the echoes, the Shakespearean echoes in the play from uh, Measure for Measure and uh, Twelfth Night. For our production of Wanusa's The Rape, with Palestinian and Israeli characters, um, set during the first intifada, which was also staged in English, we discussed the different registers of English used by Israelis and Palestinians in the script. You see it in Arabic, trying to find some analog in English is a very interesting uh, issue. The obvious example I would give is there is uh, a lot of biblical language that is used by the Israeli uh, characters, and therefore um, uh, I at length talked to Nada about using a kind of rhetoric derived from the King James Version of the Bible as, uh, in, in fact, a, a certain kind of register for the Israeli uh, characters. We also viewed films about the Shin Bet, Palestinian uh, resistance fighters read and discussed Guerra Vallejos, that's a Spanish playwright's play, The Double Life of Dr. Valmy, from which Wanus's play is adapted. Um, and we presented a lecture by a scholar who has written extensively about the history of torture, since one of the play's central motifs is the use of rape as a means of interrogation. This is another image from uh, the play. To the extent of possible, uh, in my role as dramaturg, I worked diligently to make sure that neither of these plays was circumscribed within a universe defined by my own or others' conceptions of Arab or Eastern theater or dramaturgy. Our references, like Wanus's, these were both by Sagala Wanus, both The Rape and Rituals of Science and Transformation, were thoroughly cosmopolitan. Um, therefore, our references include Shakespeare, Brecht, modern Spanish theater, feminism, settler colonialism. At the same time, they are informed by specifically local elements, such as the frame tale, Palestinian proverbs, authoritarianism of Arab regime, Zionism, etc. With Watch Your Step, which I will let play here in the background a bit um, as I speak. Um, which was inspired, as I said, by Gambaro's play. Um, it, it's a caustically ironic premise explaining, uh, the, explaining uh, Argentina's guerra sucia to foreigners. So we searched for analogs uh, to, to the Lebanese Civil War, and we investigated a number of possibilities, including put it in, putting the play in the Lebanese National Museum, putting it in the AV Archaeology Museum, before settling on the concept of a faux architectural uh, tour, walking tour, in which the guide ignores blatant traces of the Civil War. Um, it, uh, Sahar located uh, a neighborhood in the center of Beirut. Um, you're looking at it now. Um, it's a predominantly Shia neighborhood. Um, with bullet-written buildings, a roofless church, and other clear physical markers of the recent conflict. Um, uh, I should add that uh, doing site-specific work is in part a function of an aesthetics of necessity. We have no money, or we have very little money, and we don't have a performance space. Um, uh, uh, one aspect of the play is the insertion of actual scenes that were taken from uh, research with students, their parents, etc., of things that had taken place 
during the Lebanese uh, Civil War. So um, uh, what's fascinating, among other things, is it brought Sahar and our students and our performance into contact with people who lived in the neighborhood, among them an elderly woman who had lived there for a long time during the Lebanese Civil War, and she actually um, had these extraordinary stories that, that Sahar incorporated, and she performed the role of a hakawati, of a storyteller, um, telling what the neighborhood was like during the Lebanese uh, Civil War. So, um, our, um, our final production um, here is uh, Blood Wedding. Sahar will talk about it more extensively um, uh, tomorrow. It was, in a certain sense, the culmination of the work we've done together. Uh, I suggested that we do the play uh, originally for several reasons. First, uh, students in world literature responded to the play as if it were um, about their world, even though it's, of course, written by a Spaniard. Second, my academic mentor, Maria Rosa Minocal from Yale, um, who's now deceased. Um, uh, her major work is about the Arab role of uh, 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 in uh, medieval uh, uh, European literary history. Um, and she reconfigured literary history through her work. And uh, Marvin and I had had a similar conversation about a course that he gave on Islamic theater from Indonesia to Morocco and how you see necessarily the world in a different way. So um, the idea was to do the play in conjunction with a conference that would look at this new configuration. And the play became the initial event, which is to say it was the manifestation in practice of the theory. Then we had a conference about it. And um, <laughs> that's something that we've tried to do is to marry scholarship with um, uh, place. I guess I'm just about here at the end, but let me um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, um, l let me give you a, a, a few closing examples of um, the ways in which um, uh, staging blood wedding in this village in Lebanon provided what I would point to as sort of enlightening um, uh, dramaturgical practices that have sort of provided us a way forward. First of all, as the basis of the Arabic translation used for our text, Sahar used Langston Hughes' um, uh, English translation supplemented by the observations of a Spaniard um, who spoke e excellent uh, Arabic. Um, uh, second, we began thinking of uh, this work as a sort of parody of an extravagant Lebanese wedding with SUVs instead of horses and sequences filmed by drones, this is very common at Lebanese uh, weddings, where the lovers might run away and they were followed by drones, um, and, and do it on the AV campus. Um, and we realized that people would never get beyond the idea that they were on the campus. Um, and we began searching for spots, and, and uh, Sahar went, well, I have uh, friends have uh, opened a new artist's house in this village in Lebanon, let's talk to them, and in fact, we ended up doing it in the village, and it seemed as if it could not have been any other way, and yet it was this process, aesthetics of necessity, finding whatever. We consciously chose to set the play in the early 70s, shortly before the outbreak of the Lebanese Civil War, as a means of the evoking 1930 Spain, emphasizing the fact that a feud between families is a microcosm of civil war, and that no one in the 70s in Lebanon knew a war was coming and that a war was preventable. It's a very sort of Brechtian idea that you could intervene. Um, uh, you can intervene in history. It did not have to happen this way, and theater can tell you that. Um, one of the things that we used was, yes, Lorca was, of course, a visual artist, a musician, a composer, a poet, and a dramatist who drew on a range of literary and uh, artistic sources. And therefore, that allowed me as dramaturg, as curator for the designers, the directors, those participating, to create a kind of universe, a museum from which, an archive from which they could draw. Uh, the final thing, and I think this is really uh, telling, is that Sahar located an abandoned uh, cinema in the village and went, this is the perfect scene for um, uh, setting for the final scene of Blood Wedding, which is, of course, a surrealistic scene in which the lovers are running away. And um, uh, one of the staging ideas that we discussed was one that came for me from having seen a John Jesserin uh, play in the 1980s at La Mama uh, Annex, in which actors ran up on the screen and then 
off the screen and whatever, and it was quite innovative at the time. Um, and um, I think it gives you a sense of, of the extent or the range of influences and what it has taught me, and I hope uh, I'll sort of reinforce, is that the fact that we're working in this challenging environment um, and uh, we're uh, 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 defined by the fact that we really don't have that much money and we have actors of varying experience um, and we're drawing on as many things as we can, is it's reinforced to us that circumscribing Arab theater within any rubric, right, a simplistic rubric is absolutely reductionist and there's a lot of very creative uh, work and we're glad to be here to talk about our attempt to do some of it. Thank you. Thank you for being on time. So we have time for one or two questions directly to Robert, and then at the very end we might have a panel. But any about why you spoke so fast? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Might that be one of the questions? Please. Yeah. Sorry. And we need to need the mic yeah, so we have it recorded. Oh. Sorry. For sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Could you just clarify when you said that you don't have uh, AUB does not have a uh, its own theater space? And have to do site-specific work? Yes. Um, uh, there is an auditorium. We were joking we should do arsenic and old lace there in Arabic. <laughs> that would be, it, it just, you walk in and it screams high school auditorium. And there was some money which was earmarked in the 70s for the construction of a performance space. But according to Peter Shabaya, who's still there, who's an actor who trained at the Old Vic, and, um, that uh, uh, people came to him and said, right when the war broke out, that uh, we need this money for a uh, hospital or need it for medical stuff. And of course, theater always gets shunted aside. And um, uh, there are discussions, we've had them for the last five years. And then of course, Peter Sellar showed up and went, oh, it's great, you don't need it. It's great, you have no, sp and we were like, thank you, Peter. We really appreciate that. No. Um, but no, there's not really, uh, any appropriate uh, performance space um, at AB, oddly. There are two very good theaters at Lebanese American University, um, and there are theaters nearby which we have rented. Um, that's one of our options, but it becomes quite expensive. One more question, uh, Betty? Do the politics of the piece determine whether you do it in English or Arabic? Uh, that's a great, great question. Um, I think it came up most clearly in uh, the case of Aletisaf, the rape. Um, uh, why is the play being done in English? Um, and uh, I think, you know, our response to that was uh, twofold. One is that we were internationalizing, we we're in the process of internationalizing, internationalizing the program. Uh, thanks in large measure to uh, Frank and Marvin and others who, you know, gave us a platform outside. Uh, and um, uh, it was part of a translation project. It's a multilingual environment. Um, uh, the play had not been done in 20 years, and even when it was done in Arabic 20 some odd years ago, Wanus disliked the production enormously because Shawad al Asadi, the Iraqi director, had cut out all of the the Palestinians. Um, so people, we did get comments, it's an amazing play, it's a powerful play, why is it in English? And um, I think that uh, in part our uh, response now is, well, you know, it's a multilingual environment and we're working both ways in both languages. Had we to do it over again, perhaps that play we would have done. But the problem here too, it's interesting, um, there's a, a what uh, Issam Mahfouz, the Lebanese uh, playwright, calls an unintentional alienation effect caused by the use of fusha on the stage, which is to say, especially very you know pointed material like this, if it's not in the vernacular, then people are going, well, this is this distancing mechanism. So Wanus's play is in fusha; it's in a high register. So. Um, uh, but it's a very, very, very key, important question, and thanks for asking it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have more time uh, to connect. I will now ask the Lejma to come. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation. I will uh, I will not be fast because English is not my native language. So allow me to be a bit slow and also searching sometimes my words. I am very glad to be here because I thought this uh, this question about dramaturgy in our region and in uh, with uh, within the Arab and I would say uh, within the speaking Arab countries, uh, it's a very important issue. And I wanted to share that, and I am very glad to meet you and to exchange about it. So through my journey as curator and dramaturg, I am based in Brussels, but associate curator to, not bad, but kind of logic and very logical relationship with many artists in North Africa and Middle East, I have been documenting and questioning works and uh, process instead of only looking to end result as a curator, I wanted to be part of the process and to be close to many choreographers mainly. The MENA art scene is a rich and highly creative one, that's for sure. And all this year, we have been uh, looking, observing, documenting, not enough documenting, we don't have enough traces. That is one of the key questions of our performing art, is a lack of archive of the contemporary performing art. But there is, an, although with this creativity and this richness, there is an ongoing struggle for sustainability. It's, uh, a kind of a very like a, a red line for all this region that we all struggle to be uh, to go on with creation. We go to other spaces. We don't like to stay in black box because not only because we don't have them, but because those black box are significant and are related to main institution and sometimes and often the independence want to make a statement and be outside those venues and be in a, on a roof in a, uh, the Medina of uh, Marrakesh, be on a public square to block the traffic. I know a choreographer who did a slow walk and block the square of Marrakesh to say it's, uh, we are here, we are not apart, we are not uh, like at the, the alternative uh, narrative, we are part of the society. So this link with the society, being outside, inventing location, inventing format that goes with those location. I have seen it in Cairo, Marrakesh, Beirut, with many uh, of artists I worked with or I, I presented. It's in a way bringing other alternatives that are, conf they will confront and they will be against the official one. The one that we, uh, may, the one that are within the institution, within our ministry, within our, where the money is, in fact. Because finance uh, is an uh, important aspect of it. So, we, those artists are in a public space, in a non-expected places. So, they have to come where you don't expect it them to come. That is very important. That's a, re a red line within the dramaturgy of those artists. They have a very uh, real, strong relation with the society. They are not elite, mainly they are part of the society. Although that sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to be accepted and that uh, we can like transfer code that are within the performance to the society, they have this uh, very close link to the society. I uh, was in Marrakesh many times, I am associate curator to Marrakesh Dance Festival and associate curator to DKF Cairo, and I have been working with uh, many artists that are in a way obliged to be operators. That is also a main line. So those artists should take many tasks, many positions. They are not only doing their creation, they have to be engaged. 
because there is a kind of a way of making this independent work part of the big claim, the big protest. So I try to make this clear. Uh, so how uh, this pieces challenge context question urgency in a transformative time and translate this growing component of conservative conservatism in our region, in the world in general, because conservatism is not only in the Arab world, is also in Europe, is also here. So they, with the resilience and with creative performances, they bring freedom and they could like create a space for the community where we transfer this clay in a poetry, in a common and a, like a, a possible space, like creating kind of utopian space. But this will charge the community to go on, like from individual resilience we will create a, co a common collective resilience. They have in within also the, the work of different choreographers I have been following and helping as a drama group, this uh, red, red line about uh, how can you be in relation to your past and take this different multi-layered past and the pat patrimoine, like uh, if you see that in Morocco, all these dances from Ginawa, from Hamadja, and all these dances and all the, I mean, the breathing of these dances, the spirituality of these dances. So there is a kind of material that comes from the past and then they will transfer it and mix it with the actual condition because the, the condition that, well, I mean the present condition of the artist and then transfer it on stage. So I call it contextualize and decolonize. Contextualize, it's not to be said, but it's like this. I mean you are in it or you are outside, but that's what we have. So if I am, uh, I am Algerian, so we experience also the 90s, but I mean what is happening in Syria, we are all connected with, through our smartphone, or through friends, or through all uh, what the artist uh, or writer like Khal Khalifa and so on. So we are in a context that is very difficult. This context, like in the case of, uh, it can be a war time, like in Syria, but it can be also censorship harassment in Cairo. And that is a drawing from Selma Tarzi. She's a filmmaker, and when she, she's an activist also, and when she was uh, blocked in a protest and suffered from har a harassment, directly, physically, she started drawing. She's doing drawing and now she's preparing a performance. That's the context. The context is also towards all this condition and towards this uh, difficult moment and more than moment uh, in Palestine, it's more than four generations. Uh, there is a, a way of how can we be resilient? And I, I so many possibilities, many formats. They invent, invent format. Here, a choreographer just stand up silently for hours and hours. And then, slowly, people came and stand near him. And he had nothing. And he had just a small bag. And the police came and so on. Because <coughs> it is Istanbul in front of the parliament. And that is a way of how you go with your context you talk about and you transfer transfer it and you create with it. And that is another uh, piece from Taufiq in Marrakesh when they want to block the, 
the Medina of Marrakesh protesting because they had kind of no reconnaissance of their art. So they just, five minutes, so I should. <laughs> so that's contextualized, decolonized uh, the relation with the past. Reparation, what called Kader Atia, how can we repair the pain and the suffering? And that is in the case of colonialism and post colonialism. In, uh, he's an Algerian French artist. And I wanted to share with you this uh, just speak very shortly, and I might have more time later on to develop that. Three, three uh, choreographers, I want to share their work with you. Uh, it's not that, I mean, there are many working on this field, but these three, I choose them because, like, Dania Hamoud is from Beirut, and she's, uh, like, uh, theater educated, and she came later on to dance. And there is a kind of a booming in dance because maybe the body language is now uh, so important because text is difficult. Communication with text is, uh, is difficult, and uh, this, is, this body is just like booming because it, it's so charged, it's, it's captive, it's contaminated, and so on stage they are just booming. But there is different way of uh, bringing these performances. So Dania Hamoud from Beirut, she used to work with Zuhak, for the people who know Zuhak Collective, and she, she's just like against the time. She's just like freezing her body. It's a, a kind of reaction toward the complexity and the density and the the big uh, the big uh, I mean pressure on uh, the individual and in this case on women. And she, she's just in her performance uh, called Mahalli and in my location or to rest on slow. It's just like like the minimal gesture and freezing her body. Uh, that is Dania Hamoud. The, it's, with Dania Hamoud, I wanted to bring this link between intimacy and a landscape of emotion, what uh, Fesua called the landscape of emotion. Instead of looking to this landscape, the physical landscape, that is completely dense and very difficult, so there is a kind of creation of an emotional landscape through the, <coughs> the silence of it. And then I will meet Khal Sabir from Damascus, and uh, living now in Paris, he did a solo called Displacement, and that is uh, uh, another line in his references, is about how can you be rooted in Syrian heritage and culture, and uh, from that, creating a new identity when you know you lost location, when you know there is a kind of absence of ownership. So uh, Mitkal, uh, he did a, a solo called Displacement, and then he worked with two other dancers, and they did a trio. For him, it's a kind of trilogy. So solo, trio, and then he worked with 20 uh, women uh, to make it like a community project. He likes also to work with a non, I mean, to, with non-dancer, uh, uh, with uh, people that are uh, that are not formated formatted in dance school. Why? Because uh, usually when you go in education and you 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 are graduated from. Uh, uh, parts or other dance school, uh, <coughs> you have kind of references. So if he has this dance school references, he wanted to, to be open to someone who, who is not educated in this uh, uh, format. Uh, in Tawfiq Izidu, the last one uh, from Marrakesh, so you will may, might think uh, Marrakesh, Morocco, it's fine. There is no war. There is it's it's okay. It's <laughs> but it's not, the case. it's not the case because uh, if you just publish uh, 
everything is in fact controlled. Uh, any text, any flyer you put, uh, there is a real uh, censorship in a very discreet way. And when we are on public space, we we always like uh, ask permission to be on public space, and then we don't. Of course, we, we never get it, but we ask it, and then we do it. We do our performance, but we have always like people, civilian, in coming around and uh, checking what we are doing and controlling and asking questions. So there is uh, this kind of uh, dream from Tufik to have a kind of golden revolution. Uh, and that's why he worked uh, with Hassan Darsi, who is a visual artist. And I will... F one minute. So that's the... Also another uh, important maybe uh, comment on those work is that usually in this, uh, with the, all this project, I could see that there is kind of loose boundaries uh, between disciplines. So they work more easily with visual artists, with the musician. Um, there is a less a kind of expected way of doing it because there is kind of invention going on. Uh, and that's why uh, this uh, loose boundaries in disciplines brought many, many rich uh, performances and other way of looking to it. If I can, or later, maybe just a small video from <coughs> from Mithal. I had the, for each a video, but I will show <coughs> only Mithal. Yeah. I will send you all the links. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, first I have a comment and then I have a question. My comment is that I'm also a fan of Salma Tarsi's work and for those in the audience, um, she's featured in marketing <coughs> documentary Nefertiti's Daughters, which is currently on YouTube. Um, my question is specifically about um, it's a broad question about um, how does um, activism tie in with dramaturgy, and <coughs> more specifically, um, how um, you know, you know, dra the the, act, the 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 dramaturgy of activism, how it's um, tied in with site specific, and you mentioned you're know, contextualizing it. <coughs> okay. So activism <coughs> and dramaturgy, yeah. some yeah. comments. I mean, uh, there is one uh, important thing is to how, to, if you document the fact as an activist, uh, you are documenting the facts, but then there are many ways of documenting. So the question in dramaturgy is which kind of, uh, which ways are you going to use, from which position. So when I am working there, like Selma also, when she's, where is she? from where she's <coughs> taking this fact and how the reading can be. So, and then other layers, who can be, who can read this and what he will see. Like you have another example, Leila Suleiman is, is working a lot with fact and with uh, testimony from prisoners and so on. So all her work is uh, in dramaturgy is to be able to rewrite the history, but, this history will say something about our present and our future. <coughs> That's uh, Maybe one more question, if there's one. Hi. Uh, I'm curious about, you live in Brussels. I'm curious about what is the, given some of the um, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sentiment going on going in, in, in Brussels and in uh, and uh, in Europe, is is there um, how is it received? Um, plays, uh, just uh, cultural output by and about Arabs. And, and 
curious? It's, it's received uh, with a lot of curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it has a kind of proximity of question. I will give you an example. When uh, they bombed Gaza, my neighbors they already organized themselves to uh, have some solidarity action. It's, we are so linked, I mean, it's not to, uh, to be proud of my neighborhood, it's because we are connected every time. So when Erdogan is doing his campaign, you can go walk in Brussels and you will see who is pro-Erdogan and who is not. So for me, Europe is really like a, a very important mirroring of uh, forces and uh, like equilibrium that we can find. So we are co so connected, we are not anymore uh, far from, uh, from Palestine or Syria. I am living in Brussels, but I, I am really very often uh, in discussion and there in Marrakesh and Cairo. But it's sometimes I don't need, because you know, WhatsApp and uh, Viber is working 24 hours. Sure. It's always like this, I receive images, I receive documents, um, we, we, this solidarity I and mean, this exchange of ideas is very important because that's Surely. what they left us. This is the very big question. This is why we here. We, maybe you can also have a follow up sure. to in the time, but that's a very important question. Thank you so much. So we move uh, on <coughs> to um, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't. I had to keep these photos 
hidden on my fa Facebook profile, reset their privacy, and remove the tags that link them <laughs> to my account. It was the same as I hid my passion for dancing for so many years because of the fear and shaming. Being on, the, on stage that night was a live protest against a culture of shaming women's body in a specific and dancing in general. So it's not only my story, it's the story of other artists, uh, artists resisting a culture of shame and fear in Palestine, Egypt, and Tunisia. Uh, I don't know how many of you can recognize these photos. This is actually the Reda, uh, Reda Truth, in Egypt. And for so many years, they uh, Reda and Farida were the symbol of dance, but somehow a respectful kind of dance to the folkloric dancing, and also the Dakka in Palestine. So Susan A. Reed, in her article, The Politics of, uh, and Poetics of Dance, touched, touches upon the fact that dance has been always closely connected to the construction of national identity. Reed states that Dance is a powerful tool in shaping national uh, nationalist ideology and in the creation of national subjects, which becomes more evident in many post-colonial nations, where the dancer of the valorized national dance comes to be idealized as an emblem of an authentic post-colonial past. In Egypt, this was the case with the Breda troupe, the one on the left which first began as an independent folk dance company in 1959, but later the state took over it and became, became part of the public sector. And on the Palestinian scene, the same project of utilizing Dakka, the one on the right, as a symbol of national identity was also carried out. But there is a huge gap between this photo and the status quo in the Arab world, North Africa and uh, Middle East right away. Because for so many years, the only estimated uh, kind of dance was the folk dance and no other uh, dance uh, form was accepted or, or uh, respected. However, after the revolution, the situation has been drastically changed with contemporary dancing entering the scene as a way of uh, documenting people's uh, life and telling their stories. One of the, uh, one of the uh, <coughs> artists is Meher Shuamra from Palestine and the documentary uh, was actually uh, yeah, it was uh, it, it, it documents the, the life of Meher Sh uh, Shuamra uh, and the subtitle is Let Me uh, See the Sea okay. so. The rough stage documentary film is directed by uh, Tom Jarfit uh, in 2014 about Meher Shuamra, a Palestinian contemporary dancer and a former political prisoner who was trying to run a dance school in Ramallah, Palestine. However, uh, being on the occupied lands of Palestine, uh, Shuamra is not only uh, confronting an Israeli server is also confront, uh, confronting a culture of shaming out, uh, and fear because many of his uh, family, uh, family and friends doesn't know or seek to appreciate the kind of uh, the kind of resistance he is trying to uh, achieve. 
so from matter points of view, dance is an uh, activism, but the other people don't seem to understand this goal. Another uh, dancer is Rima Gardasi. She was born in 1995, and she is uh, a contemporary dancer, and she made a film about uh, the Kalandia checkpoint. And this is actually the uh, link to uh, her film. Uh, and here she doesn't only speak about the problem of the people who has to go uh, go through the Kalandia checkpoint every uh, every day, but also she is speaking about the women's struggle uh, with the checkpoint and with the occupation in general. Uh, this is actually a quote from her own uh, personal uh, Facebook. A woman, this is a movie about a woman who rejects confining to restrictive social binaries as she struggles to dance over one of the most oppressed and politi pol uh, politically intense zone of the West Bank, currently at checkpoint. This is a piece about a politically uh, oppressed nation who further, unfortunately, represses this woman. This is an actual quote from her, uh, from her Facebook account, and actually you can see more of the uh, words that uh, she uh, she uh, participated uh, and, and I'm sure you have seen uh, Rima Varnasi because there is, yeah, because there is uh, a famous video of her uh, dancing in the uh, streets of Italy. Yeah. Uh, going to Egypt, this is another uh, contemporary dance performance uh, was uh, directed by uh, Sharif Hegazi and it featured four women dressed uh, in uh, red while using uh, some of the masculine uh, some of the masculine instruments like the goblet drums known as tabla, uh, tabla or darabukka and also tahtib, they use the tahtib, uh, the stick fighting uh, also known as Asaya uh, Unakut, and the feminine uh, anklets, daily dancing, and also uh, the Rewazi, dancing of the Rewazi, the gypsy dancing. And this is the uh, performance. My brother and I, uh, and I didn't speak because of it. Uh, it is the Uncovered Inez, it was the stage and Panic in Theater in 2017. It was directed by Zosha Josemont in collaboration with Studio Amadeli. In this uh, performance, there were 24 women from different ages and uh, uh, different uh, cultural, uh, cultural and uh, economic uh, background. Uh, this is actually the link to the whole performance, and there is uh, the, a documentary about the, uh, the film and the perform uh, performance uh, itself, these links. Come to again Egypt. Those artists, the uh, contemporary dancers, are trying to reclaim the public streets and make uh, contemporary uh, contemporary dancing accessible for everyone. So one of uh, the uh, platforms for implementing such uh, such project is Mahatot for Contemporary Art and Ballerinas uh, of Cairo. Method for contemporary art actually perf uh, performance go to the metro to the public squares and to different spaces uh, places when you wouldn't expect them at all and they will just start uh, dancing and ballerinas in Cairo 
they are the Italianers from opera, but getting outside the confined space of opera to the streets, wearing uh, these colorful, uh, colorful uh, um, dresses and dance, uh, and dance between uh, the uh, public. And this is actually an expressive uh, photo to normal Egyptian women and the ballerina just sitting uh, in between, uh, tying her shoe. Uh, ballerinas of Cairo came with the main mission of uh, combating harassment and making pop, uh, art accessible for all. And going to Tunisia, I don't know how to pronounce <laughs> this in uh, French, but it, uh, the English translation is I will uh, dance despite everything. This is uh, a project uh, that was initiated by Bahari uh, uh, Ben Yahmed uh, and uh, other uh, dancers. The, uh, the interesting thing is we don't know the name of those dancers. They are uh, we, they just come to like this uh, photo to the marketplace and start dancing in the street. So actually this project in Tunisia started uh, in March uh, 2012 uh, after the Arab Spring uh, Revolution. Uh, according to Bahar, uh, Bahari, they were just uh, performing in the streets uh, when uh, some uh, some Islamists interrupted the performance, saying that go inside your theaters, the streets don't belong to you anymore. That's when the idea of uh, dancing citizens or dancing citizens came to uh, Bahari, uh, and he actually danced with other dancers in the street uh, to make art and then accessible for every uh, for everyone. And in this, uh, is, there's a seri uh, series of these uh, video, and some of them they are in the marketplace, and some of them they are in the metro station, and in others, they, uh, other videos they are just dancing in front of the Ministry of Interior, uh, and the Avenue Habib Bourguiba is the same place where they were interrupted <laughs> yeah. And I want just to mention other art and dance festival uh, in Egypt. Uh, this is I uh, I personally go to every year, and they are very active and accessible for the public and. You, and sometimes you are, you don't know where to go, this festival or this festival. So one of them is the ECAF, uh, Downtown Contemporary Art Festival, Mahragan Gustavala Tifnun al And actually it is different because it's, um, it is not only about uh, uh, contemporary dancing, but also about uh, other uh, forms uh, of Arts like uh, like uh, films, uh, songs, and uh, and interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary arts, and also uh, it uh, it, fo and it focuses on people with disabilities, and uh, the main aim is to make uh, these festivals accessible for those people, so anyone with disability can just go them to uh, facilitate uh, uh, to facilitate going to the festival. Other contemporary dance uh, festival are contemporary dance uh, night, Lady Drops and Afra, uh, CDN, and Peter is a must. It conducts so many workshops uh, for curators, art directors, and to be continued. And actually for so many years I was just going to workshops and to be continued for free. And artists from around the world, uh, they came and conduct uh, workshops for everyone who wants. Actually, some of, in one of the workshops, it said that above 18, and some, someone 
wants really to participate. He was about 14 and he just uh, participated. And the, the last uh, one is creating uh, more festivals. It is a site a specific uh, dance uh, festival uh, that explores the ancient uh, and all the historic spaces in Egypt uh, in a different way uh, through uh, dancing. I hope the mics work. I speak loud. I'm sorry. They should be better. I kind of started going into it, but I was wondering, so most of the dancers here are the ones that want to learn the like, non-traditional um, dances. So did you say they're mostly schools or most guys get together to learn or you're self-taught? Like you mentioned, go to workshops. Is that like, do you use it pretty public to know or you guys kind of underground? So how do you guys learn how to dance for the most part? Yeah, I didn't get it, how are you trained as a dancer? Are there schools who are trained or is it underground or is it people just educate themselves with workshops? Uh, actually, it's a mix of uh, all what you mentioned. So we have uh, a dance school in Egypt, uh, one, one dancing school, a Cairo, dance, uh, Cairo Contemporary Dance School, uh, and also other uh, other dancers are self-taught. Uh, other dancers go to the workshop facilitated by some of these uh, workshops to get uh, some training and conduct workshops later. And most of the uh, uh, the performance, uh, like um, the one uh, we, uh, uncovered in NAS, it was first a workshop and then uh, later uh, became a performance uh, after the uh, attempt, yeah. What, Just a, what? A small comment on that. Uh, it's an uh, important issue. There is almost no schools. Uh, there are initiatives that are uh, supported and uh, uh, done by uh, choreographer, by Kelly Mansour. Kelly Mansour, yeah. 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 Contemporary. But yeah. it's a really uh, a main uh, issue because usually they are educated uh, outside uh, in Europe or in the state and then they come back and, uh, and there is also the question how can you a sum of workshop create a training and, uh, or an, uh, so th those are questions that we are all uh, discussing there and they are kind of a big uh, gathering with all these artists uh, thinking about a school that will maybe come in Morocco and uh, that we uh, do the link between the East and North Africa also, because this link is quite uh, also uh, needed in the mobility of artists and mobility of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's much more that we talked about, and maybe even the American University in Beirut might think about you know, opening up so something if it's needed. So let's go to our next uh, speaker. Okay, it's uh, Rashi. Thank you so much. <laughs> introduction in like, actual introduction to Arab theater and so my uh, research was based in understanding how the cultural resistance of freedom theaters productions work and how does how does the resistance actually perform in so I'll start with a with a small video of their play the siege Oh. <laughs> 
תוך רעה? זה מנסבץ של חדש ותקולה ותקולה יחד צהל ושאלה ותקוע רעיה, רואה, מה רעיה? כסום בלה הביט זה לבי כאלו חרעיה, אבל עדי פינה יבואי שוא אקול עד אין מוסטיב את המעל תודה על דקר, עד שקמה תלעה עורה זה בפעש יחד, זה די לחלה בפעש יחד במרה כל מי שונה מלא לא חושב דרדה כל מי שונה דק ודק אהוי? מש אי יקאווי, קאווי מחמא סמטחוני, ותשים לה את העם פעודקים. שוב יא חביבי, תג'יר, תגלל, תעפיה מי, חוץ על הגר. יקאווי, חוץ מהדקה, מהדקתיה, חלת בעלי. ותש תחרי, ימין ושמאל, ושמאל ימין. זה מחמוד תרוויש בסוף. ושמאל יש קאווי שוב, תגלע. תגבי את הכסף הזה, אחי. תגבי את הכסף. תגבי על נוער. شو مريح شو شو دي 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 وقت أنا مع قصد القهوة شو سيجارة مانبورو يا عم عارفينها أمريكية شو العمل بس إني قد قلت لك بعدين عاد بالله عليك دوق وعطيني راحتك جرب جرب اسمع اسمع كيف I saw last year in NYU Skirball. Um, the play uh, was performed by the Freedom Theater and it's based on the siege of Bethlehem's Church of Nativity by the Israeli military in 2002 during the Second Intifada when 200 Palestinians along with 13 armed freedom fighters took refuge inside the church and were, and were trapped there for 39 days with a limited supply of food, water and medical help. The play is a retelling of the stories of six of those freedom fighters based on their personal narratives about those 39 days in siege, their struggles and debates about the decision to continue their fight for justice or to surrender as a payoff for ending the siege. The play opens with an enthusiastic tour guide, a native of Bethlehem, who takes the audience on a tour to the siege of the to the site of the siege inside the Church of Nativity. On the stage, the set is a close replica of the church with intricate detailing of gateways, old-looking walls, and ornate lan lanterns. It is a realistic play with all these elements: the set design, sound effects of gunshots, fans, and loudspeakers video projection of actual footage of the siege and even, and even the smell created through the incense smoke, creating an affect which transports the audience back in time to a depiction of what happened inside one of the holiest sites of Christianity during the Inth Fada in 2002. The play, written by Nabil Al-Rai and directed by himself and Zoe Laforty, uh, brings to us a different narrative of the event, which is a counter-narrative to the mainstream uh, propaganda by Israel. Most of the uh, Western media reporting during the event in 2002 had uh, reported this incident as a terrorist attack on the church. The play, on the other hand, carefully crafted through research and interviews with the now exiled fighters. Sorry. Um, now exiled fighters breaks away from either glorifying or demonizing the fighters as terrorists. The gunshots, cries of a wounded soldier, shouts of anger and frustration, the violence and the general loudness of the play creates an atmosphere in which the reality of the fighters trapped in excruciating circumstances is portrayed. There are scenes where these armed men are seen fighting boredom as they play games, talk about delicious feast in the times of absolute hunger, have conversations about religion and philosophy, and remember Mahmoud Darwish's coffee and Marlboro cigarettes. The fighters come across as normal human beings caught in extraordinary situation. 
the encounter between the audiences and the performances performers in a live theatrical setting allows a relationship to form between the between them and from where the audience can relate to the characters and the narrative in a realistic theatrical production like the siege the audience removed from the actual time and space of its happening witness the reenactments of the historic event it is this reenactment and the idea of witnessing that disturbs the com competency of the occupation performance of the siege in new york was thus mired in controversy and attacks that attempted to ban its performance some of the actors were denied us visas to come for the show at scoreboard Uh, the Freedom Theatre, its actors, and the Palestinian population at large, <coughs> however, are accustomed to such routine restrictions and controls by the Israeli authorities. The Israeli occupation functions in a way to create an all-encompassing, continuing siege for the Palestinians. The movement restrictions through physical impediments such as checkpoints, roadblocks, and permit system controlled by the Israeli military administration. create an architecture of occupation that governs every aspect of the lives of palestinians it's geographically divided it geographically divides palestinians into isolated blocks that fractures the society's cultural and social fabric moreover a systematic attempt systematic attempts to erase palestinian memory and history functions to disallow a palestinian identity and the demand for a palestinian nation to exist In the face of such tactics, tactics of occupation, the fluidity of theater, its power to fold different spatial and temporal locations through corporeal and narrative manifestations of transference, allows it to be a force of resistance towards the siege that the Israeli occupation constructs and the epistemicide that it performs, both literally and metaphorically. The Freedom Theater embodies such power of theater and resistance. perform both through its place and through its functioning under conditions of occupation the freedom theater located in the middle of jenin refugee camp was started in 2006 and has been functioning since then with the aim of building cultural resistance against the zionist occupation of palestinian land through theater and arts in an interview with the artistic director of the freedom theater nabi al rai He spoke about how the Freedom Theater itself is a story, a narrative about making art, particularly political art under occupation. There are some of the other pictures from the play. Theaters production touring to different cities and villages within the West Bank is another such act challenging the siege. As the plays and the artists travel within West Bank, sharing stories of Palestinians living in different zones that face different forms of military military oppression, the performances bring the Palestinian communities closer to the realities of each other. The process facilitates construction of a shared Palestinian identity. One of Freedom Theatre's projects, which specifically focused on such an exchange, was the was the Freedom Bus, which started in uh, 2011. As part of which, artists, activists, journalists, etc., would travel to different cities and villages within West Bank, with the aim of building alliance and promoting collective action. In this Freedom Ride, they used an interactive form of theatre called playback theatre. Uh, it is through which the actors gather stories from the audiences and perform those stories as improvised pieces at that location these stories would then travel to other villages and cities and would be performed at these other locations this um through this process the artists associated with the freedom theater gather a number of stories that are later interwoven into a play One of the plays that came out of this process is called is a production called Return to Palestine. The play, directed by Nisela Miranda, weaves into weaves in stories from the Jenin refugee camp and city, the Ashe refugee camp in Bethlehem, Mufafra, and Gaza. Uh, this is a small video. <coughs> I think it's not working. 
you have to wait for the The play revolves around the story of a young boy named Jar, who is an American-born Palestinian who comes to Palestine for the first time. Through Jar's journey as he travels from US to Israel to West Bank, the audience witness how the occupation functions. He goes through inter interrogations at the airport, racist attacks, checkpoints, and other forms of violence. Jar's narrative and his travels through the West Bank bring together the real life accounts of Palestinians living under occupation that were gathered during the Freedom Buses tour. The play is choreographed in a way that it can be performed anywhere, on stage, street, any other place. It is minimalistic in terms of set design and costume, live music through the Live music through the musical instrument out creates multiple effects throughout the performance. The actors stand in a small rectangular platform, which is the performance space, and the theatricality of the play is brought out through the movement and physicality of the actors' bodies. Actors use Jacquard's leg pause inspired mind movements to create various visuals of deserts, wind, waves, the road, journey through the fire valley, and so on and so forth. Movement thus holds a central focus in the play, both in terms of its perform performance through actors' bodies and in terms of the process of making the play, which included working on the different stories and different cities brought together seamlessly into a single narrative. The play for the audiences within the West Bank resonates deeply. It provides for them a moment of attachment as they see their lives being performed on, on stage as well as an understanding of how others are facing similar oppression. Return to Palestine thus becomes a way of bringing together a shared reality of the Palestinian communities, community and a collective Palestinian consciousness to the people. Uh, lastly, for this, uh, some more pictures of the performance. Lastly, for this presentation, I was also asked to present the work of some other theatre artists from the Arab world whose work interests me. So, uh, I would talk about a decent play that I saw in Jenin called London Jenin. The play was performed by Faisal Abu Aleja and Ala Shahi Hada, uh, two comedians, theatre artists from the West Bank who believe in the power of comedy as a means of resistance. Faisal, during an interview about the play, quoted George Orwell saying, every joke is a tiny revolution. The play, which is a white comedy, is a narration of their personal experiences. For the direction of the play, they collaborated with another Palestinian theater artist. Her name is uh, Paula Ibrahim from uh, Golan Heights. Uh, the play is uh, set in an immigration office's waiting room. The play, London Janine, is a humorous portrayal of the experiences of these two comedians from Jenin who grapple with questions and uncertainties of migrating to another country, whether to move to London, a city that promises a successful artistic career and the luxuries of the first world, or to go back to one's homeland where familiarity and a sense of belonging hold strong. Here, in this waiting room, the two worlds collide as memories of Jenin wrestle with the aspirations and dreams of living in London. The play, the play moves through the varying emotions, making certain subtle social and political comments, and delving into philosophical questions about home and identity. All this while keeping the humor intact, which allows a humanistic connection with the audience. The simplicity and minimalism of the form of the play complements its rich content. Empty chairs lined in different formations transform the scene from that of a migrate, um, uh, immigration office to an airplane. The preparation for seeking asylum is in itself a challenge for the two Palestinian protagonists, from preparing documents to having a convincing premise for migration. Allah and Faisal discuss their options and dwell into the possibilities of playing the stereotypes of for both Arab and English sensibilities. For a Palestinian Arab man, convincing case for seeking asylum in the UK would be if he was gay. Faisal talks about the small, simple things that he misses about home like the one last barbecue that his mother prepared for him before he was leaving for Britain. 
in Palestine, the idea of one last time, which is to do anything and everything as it, it's for the last time that one is doing it, dominates in people's consciousness as the occupation creates a reality where there is no guarantee for what the future holds. To this, Allah shares his extreme fascination with Dr. Martin shoes available in London, which have a lifetime warranty. <laughs> Contemplating whether to buy the shoes or not, Allah, Allah tries to find out if and how the warranty of the shoes would comply were the shoes taken to Jinnah. Thank you. One or two questions or remarks or um, thoughts. Um, let me give you the mic so we can hear you for the recording. Just if you could say a little bit more about the, work of the Freedom Theatre. A little bit more about, uh, just a little bit more about the work of the Freedom Theatre. Sure. So uh, the Freedom Theatre, it was started in 2006 and it was co-founded by this uh, uh, he was half Palestinian, half Israeli activist, Juliano Mir Khamis. Uh, and actually, like the history and background of Freedom Theatre goes m much before 2006, as his mother, Arna Mir Khamis, she was the one who, who came to Jenin in, in, sorry, during the first Intifada, during 1987-88, when she started this project for children of the refugee camp, where she was using arts as an alternative education means. And also, uh, after a few years, she called Giuliano there, and Giuliano and Arna, they started this theater called Stone Theater in Janine Refugee Camp, which was destroyed in 2002. And uh, unfortunately, Arna also, she had cancer, and she passed away in the 1990s. So, uh, and Giuliano went back to his, he was a professional actor, filmmaker, and doing a lot of other things. Uh, in 2000, like when the second Intifada started and Ginny was like one of the main areas where like it was the one of the main resistance <coughs> spot and there was like a lot of attack from the Israeli forces and it was a complete siege that happened inside Ginny refugee camp. Also, and a lot of houses and all were destroyed at the time. That is when uh, Giuliano, he, he came back to see to see that most of the kids that were working with Arna in Stone Theater, they had either become uh, resistance fighters and they were martyred, like most of them. There were only two of Arna's kids who still survived. And by, so what um, Giuliano, he actually made a documentary film called Arna's Children. And in that, he talks about how um, so two of the kids were still alive during the the recording when he came back in 2002 and during the making of the film one of them one of them was killed and um, so that Juliana uh, Arna's children kind of brings the whole story together and after the film was produced the money that he got he he and uh, there was another uh, Swedish activist uh, Jonathan Stanzik who was in uh, Palestine in Geneva in 2004 2005 and they got together and they thought that there is a need to have like a cultural center in Janine refugee camp, especially after what had happened with Stone Theater and for the kids of Janine refugee camp. And that is how Freedom Theater started in 2006. And unfortunately, in 2011, Juliana was also killed right outside the theater. It was shocking. But anyway, the Freedom Theater has been like doing a lot of work, of, like talking about cultural resistance, making productions which talk about like the occupation from Israel, but also occupation of like you know the corruption of Palestinian Authority and also like what's happening in the society and all those things they've been working on. They're continuing to work on Juliano's legacy and Arna's legacy. And Thank you. One more question or remark. Matty, can you take the mic? Sure. I'd love just for you to talk a little bit more extensively about how difficult it was to bring the siege um, and just to kind of give this audience, the politics of presenting Palestinian uh, so this play I had seen last year, in, uh, and as I mentioned, I saw it in this curveball. And uh, when I went to the Freedom Theater, Nabi, who is the, uh, the director, the current director, artistic director of the theater, and he's also directed the siege, I spoke to him, and he told that, so 
So the siege was actually supposed to be performed, like it was supposed to premiere in 2016 you know, with another venue in New York, and it was the performance was cancelled the last minute they weren't allowed. Uh, in 2017, when finally like things progressed and they were, uh, I mean that's what he told me that once they were even like you know when they got the permission, there was a lot of uh, pressure on the New York University. There was a lot of they should not have that the play and a lot of actors were not given their visas and they had like they had to get other casts and Nabil also keeps talking about this idea of baiting and he says that whenever we are supposed like as Palestinians whenever we have to like go on a tour, international tour, the the time period that we always keep in in, in our mind is like we go to the airport probably like two or three days beforehand because we know all the, the all the hassles that would happen for us like, during security checks and visas and all those things. So that's that's what I know. They also had the same performance in Britain, I think, and there were like a lot of protests outside theaters. There were a lot of um, pro-Israel groups who, who, who weren't happy with the, with the play happening in Britain also. So there were a lot of protests happening. There. And the Freedom Theater site was attacked actually when the siege was being performed in uh, New York. They were getting a lot of abuses on their Facebook page and things like that. Thank you. We'll have some time um, after the presentations also all to talk together. The panelists will come up front. But um, thank you thank so you much. much thank you so much for having all. And now we would like to ask um, Ashley to come. Uh, she's a student here at the uh, PhD program. Thank you. for having me, Robert, Sahar, and to our faculty, Peter, Marvin, Frank, our faculty here that's joining us and my cohort and friends here, it's exciting. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the research I did this summer in, um, at the Ashtar Theater in Palestine. So I'll be reading a bit, showing some slides. We are not producing artists, we are creating leaders in society. The words of the late Juliana Mercamis, founder and artistic director of the Freedom Theater in Janine, Palestine, still resonate seven years after his assassination. This month, the Freedom Theater will relaunch its professional theater school after a year and a half hiatus. The professional theater school is an intensive program that offers professional acting, devising, and cultural resistance education to the youth in Janine, the northernmost city in the West Bank which has seen numerous conflicts over the years and continues to emerge as a hub for Palestinian culture. This presentation will look at the unique relationship that youth theater has on shaping communities in Palestine by drawing on specific performance examples from the Ashtar Theater in Ramallah, the Al Rawad Cultural and Theater Center in Bethlehem. This past summer I received a CUNY Provost Pre-Dissertation Fellowship to conduct research in Palestine and Jordan. And my presentation is based on a very small piece of the large body of research I collected over the summer, because otherwise we would be here all day. Um, in 2017, a Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics report showed that 30% of the 4.95 million people living in the West Bank and Gaza are between the ages of 15 and 29. The unemployment rate among these people has reached 40%, disproportionately affecting those between the ages of 20 to 24. On top of that, the unemployment rate of college graduates was nearly 56%, a number that has grown steadily from the previous year. These sobering statistics, combined with U.S. President Donald Trump's recent cut of $200 million in aid 
to the United Nations Relief, Works, Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, set up what would look like from the outside a framework for despair. We as cultural workers do not have the luxury of despair, says Dr. Abdel Fattah Absuar, founder and director of the Al Rawad Cultural and Theater Training Center. When you have a child who's eight or nine years old talking about their dreams in a storytelling session and they tell you that their dream is to die because nobody cares, they've reached the summit of despair because they don't see anybody trustworthy and the political promises from politicians have only caused more oppression. This is not the legacy you can leave to children and generations to come. Al Rawad is located in the Ida camp between Bethlehem and Beit Jela in the Central West Bank and its staff work with the youth of Ida to create what they call, quote, beautiful resistance. The belief that every occupation and resistance against injustice is a beautiful act of humanity. Choosing culture, arts, and education is one way of doing this. Quote, the aim is to save lives, to inspire and to give our children every opportunity to express themselves in the most beautiful and creative and nonviolent way, says Apsuar. Quote, miracles will not happen on their own. We as artists need to make and provoke miracles. This is our responsibility. Al Rawad offers children in the Ida camp training in theater, visual, and fine arts. Additionally, they offer vocational training and often create jobs for those who take part in their programs. Similar to Ashtar and the Freedom Theater, many youth who partake in, in the community at Al Rawad evolve into assuming leadership positions at the organization when they become adults. Dr. Absuar spoke of additional challenges that Palestinian theaters face in the creation of work, highlighting the lack of financial support, including funds that are only allocated to fly in international artists to do one-off shows and projects with the community, as opposed to giving money directly to the organization to build infrastructure and execute ideas and projects of the local artists with their own community. Additional, additionally, in an, over, an overwhelming problem that both Palestinian cultural leaders and those working with Syrian refugees in Jordan are currently dealing with is negotiating around funding for projects that don't support the youth or mission of the organizations. For example, Al Rawad was offered $5,000 by a large NGO to create a show about AIDS. When Dr. Absuar expressed that the transmission of HIV and AIDS was not necessarily a pressing issue in the Ida camp, and that needed to be addressed in the show, a show about dental health, the water crisis, education, or the occupation is more relevant, the money was revoked. In many cases, large NGOs often hold the purse strings that allow for theater projects to be realized. NGOs functioning as dramaturgs in areas of conflict is not a new phenomenon, but with the current refugee crisis, it's notably, notably increasing detrimental and even downright dangerous, as NGOs often employ non-theater makers to lead projects that often ask young people to perform traumatic stories of displacement and violence to meet United, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals without providing the proper mental and emotional support. There is an ever-present, robust, and continuously thriving theater and performing arts scene in Palestine that creates various genres of work including classics, Shakespeare, dance theater, and oral traditions inspired by Hakawadi, a centuries old Arab storytelling tradition with roots that can be traced throughout the Middle East. The stakes are high for theater makers across Palestine. Just last month, on August 9th, the Saeed Al Michel Theater and Cultural Center in Gaza was razed to the ground by an Israeli airstrike. The building had been one of the last cultural spaces to bring music, dance, and theater to the residents of Gaza. Shortly after the bombing, hundreds of artists and community members gathered on the ruins to perform and show strength and solidarity. The space has also been the base of the youth group for the Gaza branch of the Ashtar Theater since 2008. A five-year educational program for young actors founded by actors and writers Iman Aoun and Edward Mualam in 1991 Ashtar was the first theater school in Palestine. It offers young people ages 14 to 24 rigorous training in acting techniques, physical theater, theater of the oppressed, as well as dance, uh, as well as chance to develop and amplify their leadership skills beyond the stage. This past July, the nine graduating students of the Ashtar Theater 
helped coordinate the fourth annual Ashtar International Youth Theater Festival, which brought together artists and theater trainers from across the world to participate in 10 days of workshops, showcases, collaborate with other Palestinian organizations, such as the Yes Theater in Hebron, with them and the popular theater in the Alamari refugee camp and collectively devise a final performance together. The Ashtar International Youth Theater Festival provided a rare opportunity for both Palestinian youth and internationals. Delegates traveled in from Russia, Poland, Germany, Norway, and the United States for cultural exchange and to build fellowship and solidarity. Through physical theater and movement exercises impro and improvisation, students work to transcend language and geographic locations, challenge stereotypes, and train and devise theater pieces together. Festival attendees spent 12 hours a day together in classes, rehearsals, watching performances, and eating all meals as a collective. This experience of living in tight quarters for 10 days with performers and theater specialists from across the globe had a profound impact on all its participants inspiring new friendships, collaborations, partnerships, and unbreakable bonds that are maintained through regular social media contact and Skype calls long after the last event of the festival. This experience also allows for solidarity to be created between Palestinian and international cultural workers. Theater students put into practice the lessons they've learned in classes over the years regarding physical preparation, performance techniques, and moreover, physical endurance. Beyond the psychosocial impact that theater has, providing youth with structure and discipline and instilling them with a strong work ethic and professionalism is of utmost importance to the Ashtar staff. On the night before the festival opened, during one of the note sessions following tech rehearsals for Pier Ghent, a new Arabic adaptation created by Iman Awun and Emil Andre Saba, an alumnus of Ashtar, Saba, the director, and Mashu Kapustina, the choreographer, set, and costume designer, there, did not hold back in providing honest feedback to the students. Quote, there's no excuse to not have your costume changes down and to not know your choreography, remarked Kapustina. Saba called in several of the students who felt we're not giving them all, good, we're not giving their all, reminding them that in ensemble productions, everyone's responsible, and one weak link or bad attitude can ruin an entire production. The bar is set high, and Ashtar students are expected to not only reach it, but surpass it. Each of the young people seemed to have an understanding of this, and were working extra diligently to prepare for opening. For the youth at Ashtar, creative expression and political resistance are deeply interwoven. Every festival gathering, including the most mundane bus rides evolved into a party with traditional dabka, dancing and singing, quote, our spirit will never be broken and our culture will live, one of the youth proclaims as she dances on a bus while passing an Israeli checkpoint. Quote, we will sing and dance our way to freedom. On that particular evening, the bus went through the checkpoints without being stopped. This would not be the norm for other rides. Saba explained that due to Israeli travel restrictions in the West Bank, quote, a lot of youth have never seen the sea before. In Pier Gint, there's a lot of talk about water and the ocean, so it helps students imagine. A lot of elements of water are missing in our daily lives. It helps the youth to talk about it and to see it on stage. Also, this fantasy element is important because our lives are very ingrained in the reality and concrete gray blocks. So seeing something that encourages you to think and to imagine and to travel somewhere else with your mind is very healthy and important. <coughs> Quote, art can be a very strong tool of revolt and fighting back against oppression, but it can also be separate from that, adds Amir Zabanet, who plays the title role of Pierre Ghent. Political art does not need to be as direct as a poem about the occupation or a painting of the colors of the flag. When you break people's expectations and smack them in the face with something new, that's when you start making change. When you give them fantasy, even if people have a negative impulse towards it, it does something." End quote. Similar to other areas of conflict throughout the world, theater in Palestine is imperative in providing a space for imagining alternatives and new futures. Palestinian youth are using theater to challenge expectations, the expectations the world has for them, and the expectations they have for themselves. As Michael Balfour, Jenny Hughes, and James Thompson write in Performance in Place of War, quote, 
The imagination is the first stage of creating or recreating an external world that has a life beyond the body and generating material and social connections that reinforce protection and resilience of individuals and communities, end quote. Ashtar, Al Rawad, and the Freedom Theater and other programs like these are providing a space for youth to not only imagine the future for themselves, but to also create it. Thank you. <laughs> with the UN, with the White House, and um, I actually left the, I left the organization because I found a lot of those practices problematic and against the, um, the nature of the work. So yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem here, and it's a problem across the world. It's um, you know, this larger problem of arts funding, lack of arts funding, and lack of giving resources to the artist as opposed to having other um, it wasn't, I didn't submit directly to the UN, it was through organizations that do it. You don't submit, there's no, as far as I know, there's no direct submission policy to the UN. Um, it's, it's you make the connections through um, organizations. One more thought or remark or question? Good. Um, so I think uh, since we really, I would like to thank all the participants. Yeah. Um, if all the panelists could come up front and we have an open, uh, open uh, discussion or call, <laughs> and uh, we can ask uh, all additional questions. Well, we have half an hour or something, and um, well, we can actually sit down. going to share a mic up here, I'll just give it now. And um, just uh, in, uh, in general, Tom, maybe let's wait for somebody else who just uh, had a question. Sure. This is uh, just a general question. Um, are there ways we've seen archived performances of Arab-inspired plays? Like what ways that we as audience members can we view them? Do you know if there are, you know, the Arab Performing Arts Library, for example? Um, I know can you take the microphone, sorry? In terms of the plays this summer from Ashtar, um, they're they're on HowlRound. On the um, we did a, a live feed of everything, so you can find them archived on HowlRound. All of the plays from the festival. Maybe other stuff. So, can you see the plays? Uh, Robert, where can I see your plays? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Closer. Have, yes. Uh, <laughs> Most of the productions we have done are archived at both. We have a Facebook page, Theater Initiative, uh, at the American University of Beirut, and also uh, a web page, which we try to update. Um, we're currently working on the, um, a, a sort of final cut of, of the film that's based on Blood Wedding, uh, is the, the most recent thing that we have there. But we have um, a a great deal of material uh, associated with all of these productions that I talked about today that are there and readily available. Uh, so that, I know that uh, Ashtar is the largest uh, Egyptian choreographer initiated a um, platform called Havana to archive the that's from Insulid. And there is also, uh, it's uh, within some collective, festival like uh, 
Bikev and Menshi Festival in Marrakesh. Uh, there is, they have Facebook, but that is virtual, but you will find them on this page for festival. So Mahabbat, Bikev, Omarsh, Menshi, from the I'm sorry. Are most of the performances subtitled as well? Are most of the performances subtitled? Uh, yes, yeah. our, uh, ours are. And, uh, and the, uh, to go back to this question about translation, which I didn't really adequately an answer because I didn't have time. Um, uh, Certainly, the, the plays in um, Arabic are um, uh, subtitled into English. And when we performed uh, at least uh, uh, the rape, um, we projected titles in Arabic so that people would not feel excluded uh, if English was not uh, you know, one of the languages they spoke. And in addition to that, uh, a number of the scripts themselves um, uh, have been published or will be published. Uh, there's a collection of uh, Manus plays that I co-edited and co-translated. It's coming out from Yale early next year, and then another from Brill of political uh, plays from the Levant. And so you can actually look at the texts uh, there, too. Um, but yes, the short, shorter answer um, is yes, they're subtitled. The long answer to, to the translation question is that the American University of Beirut is an English language um, uh, university, and yet we're in this very interesting moment in theaters playing it out of what language you produce in and in the classrooms. Any thoughts, question? Yeah. Um, since a lot of the performances kind of have to do with resistance and expression, is do you guys find it difficult with these productions, whether involvement or from stories, that to get people involved with them, whether it's just seeing or being part of the production? Is it difficult to engage people to see your productions or participate? I will speak about uh, Egypt. So. Yeah, it's hard to uh, some some of the times that uh, we we received uh, from the audience that it was hard to watch uh, these uh, performances. In some other cases, they won't understand it. <laughs> but uh, and and some of the playback and uh, psychodrama. Uh, performances, it is really hard and, uh, and intense for both the uh, performance and the uh, audience uh, to participate in such, uh, such, ex in in such experiences. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the, the relation with an audience is uh, a relation that can be uh, built step by step. And that takes time, and that is one of the responsibility uh, and, uh, and maybe the concern. How can we address and to whom we address performance? And I think it's a process also. It's, uh, we need to work on it. And uh, sometimes it goes smoothly, and sometimes it's a kind of unfinished conversation between the performer and the audience. Well, certainly, uh, I, I concur with that idea that you build a community, and we have looked at uh, looked at it as building a community. And one of the things that we have tried to do in that process is to dismantle received notions about what constitutes a theater audience or who it's for, and try to say it's for everyone. Um, one of the things that we've encountered uh, is that since we work within a university environment, which is not so rare in, say, the U.S., where you have, you know, Yale Rep and Yale Drama School and whatever, and people take it quite seriously. There is a sort of uh, uh, other tier for university productions and university theater festivals, and to try to um, uh, reinforce the idea that the model that we have is new. We want very, very. Um, uh, aesthetically uh, sophisticated with, within a very limited budget uh, productions 
uh, in which students are working side by side with professionals and we have virtually no money. So we're trying to do all of those things at once, um, but we have through uh, language, through social media, everything else, and through site-specific work, reached out to um, as wide an audience as we possibly can, and that's one of our, our main goals is to uh, increase that audience. Yeah. Uh, Sahar? Do you want to say something? Yeah. So, uh, for Freedom Theatre, I mean, I've spoken to Nabil about this, and he says that it's interesting when they bring their uh, plays, like what happened with the siege, especially like in Britain and all, there, there always is like a very divided audience. Of, uh, there are people who are like very you know, pro uh, Palestine, and they come also for like, you know, to show some solidarity, and there are people who are against the pro-Israel and they would have like all these protests and stuff. But what is also interesting is like the, the so how uh, Freedom Theatre itself when it started in uh, in, the, in the refugee camp and their interaction with the community there and the, like the audiences within the, within the community and how the audience there has grown seeing the plays and uh, it's very interesting, like you Nabil know, talks about how like now they're, they've become very, very like, you know, they're very critical about Freedom Theatre's performances and also it, like initially of course it was also difficult to get the audiences to the theatre because the society, like there were a lot of restrictions, like you know, women performing on stage was kind of a taboo and so like uh, progressing through all these things has been also a journey with the Freedom Theatre the audiences of Geneva to the camp and also other places in the rest of time. So. Yeah, I have a question for Iman. I'm curious about the performance uh, uncovered on mass. Would you tell us a little more about the inspiration? Uh, who were these women? Are they all professional like dancers? Was it part of the project? Just a little bit more about the themes, I guess, of the performance. Okay, who's uh, on Studio Amade in Facebook? That's just an invitation link for participation in uh, Dancing the Sub workshop. It was a workshop uh, conducted by Zosha uh, Domont. Uh, she was um, in residency uh, program uh, in collaboration with uh, Studio Amade She's from England. And she came to just to give one workshop for women because not uh, in Egypt, not all the women would go to mixed uh, dancing workshop and not to a uh, dancing workshop in general. So it started with, with just one workshop, Dancing the Self One, and there was a huge uh, participation. So many women wanted to participate, so Zosha conducted another workshop, uh, uh, Dancing the Self Two. And it came, and it, she kept conducting, uh, conducting uh, the same workshop for around a year, and none of them were adaptions. Were none of them have even tried dancing professionally before. But it was a journey of really use your time of uh, discovering yourself. And actually, in the uh, it's a bank uh, documentary uh, about uh, making uh, the. Uh, show uh, and what uh, later so you can see uh, women from the workshop speaking about their experience from even touching their own body was after they didn't discover they got to discover that during participating in the workshop and uh, after the year the social uh, socialist to, uh, to make uh, um, a performance to uh, be uh, for the public, and 25 women were encouraged enough to uh, go to one of the stages. It was our first experience, and it uh, came with lots of mixed feelings because we, we didn't know how we were. our first uh, time to be on the stage, but actually it was a great experience for each and every one. Uh, you can see the movie and people, uh, women speaking about their experience and 
uh, Zosha actually, uh, it was a part of her uh, master uh, thesis. Uh, I'm what, I'm, uh, it's a movement uh, for women. This is a part of her thesis. Uh, and so you, you, you should see the movie. Yeah, I encourage you all to see the movie because it's a huge journey of uh, discovery. A bit louder, sorry. I have a question for the, for Rush. And um because like as we know Juliana was killed and as you mentioned there was um, there were very few surviving members of Arnold's children. So I'm curious like now if um, if the work that Freedom Theatre is doing uh, still seem to be posing a threat to the occupation. So how are how are the members negotiating this threat? Uh, so, uh, firstly, Giuliano, he was scared by this, um, like, they don't, they still don't know who actually killed Giuliano, so of course there is, like, a lot of uh, threat that the, the theater faces, like, up, especially, like, after what happened. But this, like, I mean, the, of course, the theater was also harassed after Giuliano's death because it's really, like, you know, people from the theater were taken into custody and they were, like, kept in prison and interrogations and all happened and the, the Israeli defense forces were like, you know, suspecting people from the theater itself and it was like a really, really dark period for them, like, you know, both recovering from the incident and also going through these kind of attacks. But I think they're continuing, they're continuing to do the work and it's, I mean, so, uh, there's this uh, quotation by the students the graduate students from the acting school who, who learned under, who were practiced under Giuliano, and they talk about like how like Arna's legacy continues, and after Arna's children, here Giuliano's children, and continue to work on the, 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 the values of cultural resistance that Giuliano used to talk about. So there's, of course, there's like mourning, and there is a, a large space that Giuliano has left, but also like his words and. I mean, I have been reading and I've been watching his interviews and he's very charismatic, he was a very charismatic personality and just listening to his interviews was like so inspiring. For me as somebody who hasn't met him, so I'm pretty sure they put them, it's it's actually like a battle now that they have to continue to think that it's not going to stop the world to be on the it's not. Question for Matt, but also for everyone in the lab. <laughs> is um, is there any? Would you say there's any lasting legacy of um, the so-called Arab Spring with the arts? Is there any? Is anything unleashed that hasn't been put back in the box, or has it the cultural expression has it changed? Is something? Or is it just repression, you know, in Egypt? But also, I'm curious about. You know. uh, actually, after the Arab Spring, uh, most of the women in the workshop were participants in the Arab Spring. The what? Participants. Okay. They participated in the Arab Spring. Uh, actually, uh, most of the artists I spoke about. They were activists in the arts spring, and somehow dancing has provided them with another uh, way to resist and to tell their stories. And even if they feel have the feeling that the revolution has failed them, so they resorted to another way to complete this resistance and continue. So that energy is still around. The energy is still around, yeah. Maybe, Adalia, you can make a comment. Or um, I feel like the margins of expression were kind of uh, exploded or opened widely because for a while there was no um, government mm -hmm. <laughs> in so many countries. And um, that allowed so many people to find a voice, to claim spaces, to like do graffiti on mm -hmm. government buildings. Mm -hmm. And that public space is not open anymore, mm -hmm. but other spaces that um, 
open within people. And I teach in the university, and the students I teach now have seen five or six governments in their very short life. Mm -hmm. I've lived under one dictator for 30 years. So it's a, change is, be, is becoming part of the way they are operating in general. Um, so the public spaces are not as open. The margins of expressions are closing, at least in the Egyptian countries. And, um, they're clo they are closing. They're closing, and um, the censorship is really tight. Like, they, they objected to a word in my last day, word dirty. They didn't want me to use the word dirty. Right. <laughs> it's like, um, so, with, yeah. <laughs> so they're, re they're really very active in targeting people. They arrested a whole crew of young um, performers performing something in a, a sporting club. They are still in jail. They've been in jail yeah. for a few months because they didn't get the right approvals. Or so the, the, those spaces are closed. But something inside the psyche of people okay. that open is is not going to be okay. under that, control That's what anymore. I'm curious about. So that is oh, that's still open. Yes, I I, I believe. So. I would like to to add uh, to this uh, because I completely agree on that and. Uh, I have seen it, uh, although like the censorship is uh, really now very high, uh, they, are, uh, they have sophisticated ways of uh, limiting like uh, some theater performer uh, and some uh, dancers. But in fact, they, there is a kind of trust now. Uh, what happens, happens. Like Ben Ali and Mubarak are gone. And this is there. Uh, because like when you are in Tunis and when you attend Dream City, it's another uh, very important uh, platform for art and uh, in the urban fabric, or really all the urban fabric. So it's you can really feel that there is a kind of the claim for dignity is the common space, and it's no more we can no more go back. Although we know that it's not done, it's not in our hands. But uh, like performances are going on. In theater, there are many plays uh, in dialect, um, many new contemporary authors uh, in Tunis, in, in Morocco, in uh, bloggers. Uh, it's also for me a way of writing new plays. So I think that there's this possibility that we never, they will never erase it. Well, in terms of Lebanon, I think uh, Sahar and others can probably speak with more authority than, than I can, but I would make a, a couple of observations. Um, num number one is that uh, in spite of Lebanon's uh, reputation for uh, openness, uh, there are moments in, in the recent uh, example of a reading of a gay play that was shut down um, uh, should dispel that myth. Um, it's open except when it's not. It's put it that way. Um, but I think that uh, what uh, has taken place um, that is a very encouraging sign in Lebanon, there's still a little place for a little public space for action, and I think people have come to the realization they cannot wait for the government to act, nor wait for NGOs or whatever to act. And, and the creation of uh, this new uh, secular party, Medina, is incredibly encouraging. And that people are looking not so much to these sorts of you know, social uh, uh, signifiers that are seen to be progressive in the West, but you know, how's your garbage getting collected? How are you going to get clean water? That is, uh, these are things that cut across, you know, all uh, categories, whether they're confessional categories, categories of sexuality, of uh, all kinds of refugees. So I do see that energy and that recognition of a kind of activism. Sahar and uh, Amal may have, you know, sort of other ideas since they have, you know, insights and others here, but. Those are two things that I've noticed that seem, in, in part, to be uh, as a result of the so-called Arab Spring. Yeah. Well, maybe just to that, just to add uh, exactly what Robert is saying, but we have to deal, even us, uh, you know, working with the, uh, the academic institution, we have to deal with the censorship all the time. Like you cannot put anything on stage before prior censorship, you have to send your textbooks 
censorship office, they they like you like they did with you. They sometimes even <laughs> in Lebanon they would give you their own uh, whatever wording. Amal and I were working on a play, <laughs> and they actually edited the text. So instead of saying that word, they suggested that we use us, you know, alta, or you say like a softer. So they're acting as good dramatists. Yeah, yeah, state drama. Yeah, so so you, I mean. You either, there's two ways that Lebanese artists are doing it. You either be very provocative to an extent that your play will never open, you know, and then they use this for marketing. And sometimes, like, what we do is we self-censorship before sending a text because we want the story to be out there. So we just, you know, we, we do some compromises. Like, we did the, the play that Robert mentioned, Rituals of Science and Transformation. That play has many themes, amongst them uh, homosexuality. So there's a, a couple of um, bodyguards that come out as uh, gay and bisexual on stage. And what I did before sending the text to the censorship office is I removed all the stage directions. Because if you read the words, the dialogue, it can be you know between any two men. Uh, and then we were lucky that they didn't come and see the play. But if they saw the play, they can, you know. So yeah. It's not as people like to portray, you know, Lebanon. It, you know, we love to say that we have, we're more free or liberal, or like liberated than the rest of the Arab world. It's not true, simply. Yeah, we have many dictators. You had one dictator. We had <laughs> a few of them. You know. Yeah. Well, it's also, I think, vitally important to remember that number one, uh, the, this kind of censorship, say in Great Britain, was taking place until the mid 60s. So before anyone forget, you know, if you go and look at like, That's you know, the life. censorship office, you know, you will find, you know, the this kind of most grotesque homophobic notes from the censorship office as race recently as the mid 60s. So, you know, lest mm -hmm. anyone think, oh, you know, West, East. And the other thing is, I think that a lot of the work we've tried to do is we put the theatrical work first and uh, uh, therefore if we're doing Blood Wedding or we're doing King Lear or whatever we're doing, it's about here and it's about now. And that's also true obviously of Wanusa's uh, work when we did uh, that work and other site specific work. And there may be things in it people like or don't like or the censors will accept or not. Um, but uh, if you're trying to create complex art as the first sort of step for social activism, I think that, um, in, in fact, you'll find quickly what it is people don't want you to talk about. <laughs> and it may not be exactly what you think. You go, oh, you can't talk this way about women or sexuality or you know the clergy. or You'll think these certain things are the actually, and it, there are some other, you know, sort of uh, things that you'll uh, discover. It's worse than you It's worse than you thought. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe one or two last. Uh, extending the conversation about um, censorship, I wanted to ask uh, Ashley and Sha'an about the situation in Palestine. So the funding aspect is the cutting the, <laughs> the money at the source, but are there other, like, more detailed textual work, who interferes with the text, who, who can stop the work when it's um, about the open? I mean, the Israelis stop a lot of the work in Palestine. Um, many of the youth have spoken to having experiences where they were putting on shows and couldn't because uh, they were afraid they were get shut down by the Israelis, and that does happen often. Um, you know, we did see a show by the Yes Theater um, where they toured a piece called A Groom in a Suitcase about domestic violence in Hebron. And they did it in Ramallah, and they were actually touring it all over, but I saw it in Ramallah. And it dealt with um, a woman's place in society and a woman's place it, are they in the house, like housework and then also in um, the larger society. And um, there was a talk back after, and the talk back got so heated that people were uh, leaving, people were being pushed out, like it became a huge debate between um, audiences, between the actors speaking directly to the um, audiences about it. And um, one of the actresses in the piece was the first woman in Hebron to ever be on stage and received death threats and, um, you know, has a, a history of 
being censored in that way. So there's, there is internal censorship, but a lot of the censorship that uh, most of the people I spoke with are dealing with um, also comes from the Israeli. I think that the freedom theater is like, is there is like the Israeli forces, they already see the theater as a, as a, like a friend of mine was telling that, you know, one once he was, I think, crossing one of the checkpoints and they, they saw that he's from the freedom theater and they were like, you know, he was a theater terrorist. It was just so funny to me, like, what do you mean by theater terrorist? Like, Anyway, but, uh, so I think there is like when they're performing, there is a certain kind of self censorship in terms of when they when they have performances in Jinnin refugee camp in terms of like how much because there are still like a lot of taboos about what can happen on a like a theater stage and what should be. So in terms of that, I think there is but when like you know they when they will talks about occupation, about this, like what this dad is doing, then of course, I mean, they're, they're there for it, talking against the occupation. They're already facing a lot of attacks from the, and the other probably like the censorship that they also face is in terms of funds that they receive from organizations outside, and uh, they talk about like this occupation, which is like one is like Israeli occupation, the other is like Palestinian authority, and the third is also like the funders, so a lot of funders, when they're sending funds, they would like always have this thing that we can talk about this, but maybe they try to deal like, you know, I mean, it's difficult to work without funds also, so it's, it's a constant battle, right, I suppose. Good, so I would say um, um, thank you uh, all. Let's end the session here. We I would like to see you all uh, five minutes to six. We're going to start on time at six o'clock again here. It's going to be a very interesting uh, talk by Rafa Bilal. I think we should have a significant contemporary artist. And he's talking about his work in visual arts, but also in performance. And to look at the sense of dramaturgy. And I would like to thank you all for coming and taking your time to listen to this really important, uh, significant theme. And as uh, far as we know, perhaps it's the first conference on dramaturgy in the, in the Arab theater and the Americas, but perhaps uh, also uh, worldwide. So we haven't heard of something else. So this is a very significant beginning, and not everything can be said, and we uh, will include more and more, but I think it's a, it's a very good start. And I would really like to thank all the participants. I apologize for the time pressures I put on everybody, but I think uh, uh, it worked well. We get an idea on inspiration. They all are going to be here for two days, so you can talk. and. Uh, ask them all the questions, we will make a little documentation as a, a booklet, but also as a PDF, and then uh, perhaps with the Arab Stages magazine. So again, uh, a big applause for our... Uh,